Uh, the title for our message this morning in that little clip was the first thing that came to mind, uh, but that's kind of what it is. Uh, that, uh, that Yakety Yak 1958 song by a band called The Coasters, that was a little more modern rendition, we'll call it, uh, by a German band uh, by the name of The Drapers. And I'm not really sure if it's good or bad because as I was reading the second half of chapter 14 in, in Numbers, that really is one of the first things that popped into my mind. Um, those of you that are of my generation, maybe that's the first thing that popped into mind because I'd watched The Great Outdoors not too terribly long ago. Now I see some smiles. You remember that's the opening song into that movie. And it's, it realistically, it's a pretty memorable song as well. Uh, and and the, the interesting thing about it is it works really, really well to characterize the relationship between God and his people who are now wandering in the desert, the, the Israelites. And so let's do this. You got, to, you got a couple clues already. And so if you know the song, maybe this is the first time you've heard it, uh, I want to try and do this. Because if you remember, that song is... For the most part, it's a list of do this or you can't do that, right? So what I'm going to try and do, and I'm going to need some, some feedback here, is I'll give you the A line, so do this or, and then let's see if you remember the second line. So it's, it's uh, take out the papers and the trash or you don't get no spending cash, right? Uh, if you don't scrub that kitchen floor... You ain't going to rock and roll no more. Okay, this is the last one. This one's a little bit more difficult. We didn't, we didn't hear it. Uh, it's get all that garbage out of sight or you don't go out Friday night. I, I actually really like the last verse. It, it brings it full circle. Just tell your hoodlum friends outside you ain't got time to take a ride. Yakety yak, don't talk back. Uh, Parents, does that ever, I mean, does that sound at all familiar? Do this, or you can't do that. Clean your room, or you can't do this. Do your chores, or you can't do that. It's interesting because in Scripture, we see this same sort of exchange. This same sort of father-child relationship between God and uh, his dealings with his children. I mean, that's you and me as well, but specifically here in Numbers, dealing with the Israelite people. And so if you were with us last week, or, uh, we, uh, we've been working through the book of Numbers, and we've, been, we've called the, the series Road Construction because the Israelites ran into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock on the way to the Promised Land. Most of the time, well, all the time, uh, they ran into those roadblocks because they did what they weren't supposed to be doing. Or they did something outside of God's will for them. And so last week we covered uh, chapter 13 and the first half of chapter 14. And if you remember, it's, excuse me, it's the story of the spies. So what God does is he tells Moses, look, uh, I need you to get the leader from, or the leader from each tribe. So there's 12 spies. If you remember the kids' songs, 12 men went out to spy out Canaan land. Ten were bad, two were, no, that's the other way. Bad, two were good, right? And so God tells all these guys, get the leaders of every tribe, they're going to go over to the, the land of Canaan, they're going to spy it out. And so what happens is, is they go over there. Uh, this, this Canaan land, the place that was promised to them, that was promised to their forefathers. And when they came back, they give this just glowing report of what the land uh, had to offer. You know, it was rich in fruit. It was, it was rich in pasture land and there were trees and, and this place was just fantastic. It was awesome. The, the, it characterizes the place that's flowing with milk and honey. So this is the place you want to be. This is the land of promise. This is the place that generations ago, God said we get to be there. And they send out the spies and they're like, oh, this place is fantastic. But then there's the bad report that comes. Because not only do they say all of those good things about this Canaan land, this land of promise, uh, they also saw the people that lived there. They also see that the people that lived there lived in fortified cities. And really what they did is because of that report, they convinced the rest of the people in Israel that they shouldn't bother. 
that they shouldn't bother trying to take it because there's, there's many, many fighting men over there. They've got fortified cities and, you know, we, we don't think we could take them. And so that bad report they give uh, to everybody and they talk about it and, and so they, they manage to convince everyone that they shouldn't even bother to take this land that God was telling them to go and claim for themselves. And so God... Naturally, because he had provided for them. Remember, he's providing manna. He provided quail, much to their dismay. Um, he, he directed them through the, des- through the desert. And so God naturally, when the people say, you know what, we're not going to go, he's naturally a, a, a little not pleased, let's call it. He's not pleased with their decision. Uh, and so he communi- communicated to them because of their fear and their lack of faith uh, that he was going to cause them to stay put. That he was going to put that roadblock in their path. That they would not get to enter the promised land. And so this morning we, we cover a little bit of that as well as the part that comes after it. Uh, we're going to look at it a, from a little different perspective uh, because it wasn't just fear that detoured the Israelites. It wasn't just fear that kept them out of the promised land. It was also disobedience. And so the next section that follows, we're going to read uh, about six verses here. It's in Numbers 14 if you have your Bibles with you. We're going to read uh, verses 39 through 45. And here's what God's word says. When Moses told these words to all the people of Israel, that is what God's judgment is, right? So what Moses is telling the people is, look, you're going to have to wander for a while. Moses tells them it's not going to happen for 40 years. So that's what Moses is telling the people. When Moses told those words to all the people of Israel, the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country saying, here we are, we will go up to the place that the Lord has promised for we have sinned. But Moses said, why now are you transgressing the command of the Lord when that will not succeed? Do not go up for the Lord is, uh, is not among you lest you be struck down before your enemies. For there the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you and you shall fall by the sword. Because you have turned back from following the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them even to Hormah. So God told them, just to sort of summarize this, God told them that, look, you're going to have to wander. You're going to have to wander. And when they heard about it, they they were really cut to the core. And I don't doubt their conviction one bit. You know, in in verse 39, it says that the people mourned greatly. Other translations will say that they wept bitterly. Like, I I don't doubt their conviction and that they were upset by all of that. But they decided to go anyway. And here's where it gets really interesting. So Moses warns them of, of what the repercussions to making such a decision might be. And yet they go. They, they go and they're beat down. They're, they're not just roughed up on the battlefield. It says the Amalekites and the Canaanites pursued them. So their defeat didn't just stop there. You know, if they came up from the south, which is kind of the direction we think we came, they came from, they were beat down here and then they were pursued backwards. And so not only are they getting beat in battle, they're running from them. They're tucking tail and headed the other direction. And so the interesting thing is, well, there's lots of interesting things. We could make a list. Um, So what do you and I have to learn from all of this? I mean, that's the the important thing. This is a, a wonderful historical narrative. You know, this happened, this is God's dealing with his people, but what difference does it make to you and I all these years later? What lessons can we take to heart and apply to life from the stories of Israel's disobedience? And the first lesson we can learn from from their bad example is that when God says jump, you jump. When God says jump, you jump. When God says go over there and take hold of that promised land, drive out the Canaanites, you do it. You know, how does the old expression go? 
You know, it's, well, when I say jump, you ask how high. Well, that's wrong. When God says jump, you don't bother asking how high you jump. That's the end of the story. You jump to the greatest of your ability. We can see this in a couple places in this story. Um, one, God told them to go and take possession of this land and that this land was given to them. God said, go and do it. And then they didn't. And then they wouldn't for another 40 years. So we can see disobedience there. God told them to do it and they didn't. Here's the next thing. Here, here's the next situation where we see that disobedience. So again, God told them that because of their disobedience, because they didn't jump when God said jump, because they didn't go take the land when God told them to take it, that they would have to wander the wilderness for 40 years. So then what do they do? The, the punishment comes down, you're going to wander, and then they disobey the punishment that became, or that fell on them because of their disobedience. You see what's going on there? So we disobeyed, so here's the punishment, and then you give us the punishment, we don't really agree with it, so we're just going to disobey again. You can see how things are compounding here. And then they end up paying the price for it again. But this time it's not something that God said. It's not God said, look, uh, you're going to have to wander the wilderness. You know, this second instance of disobedience, it doesn't come at the hands of a loving father. It doesn't come at the hands of God. This time it's the Amalekites and the Canaanites who all but wipe them out. So who was the one, and I know that there's some, um, who was the one that when they were grounded for doing something wrong, you know, for not jumping when mom or dad said jump, who was the one that said, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do that anyway? You don't have to raise your hands. Mike, thank you. Every, Mike raised his hand. <laughs> I did that. Who's the one that when they were grounded that they'd climb out of the window to go to the party? That they climb out of the window to go see the boyfriend or girlfriend? You don't need to raise your hand. Realize that's what they're doing here. God says that he's grounding them. That he's putting this roadblock on their path. And they say, you know what? I, the way I see this scene playing out in my head is that they gather a bunch of people and they're like, you know... God, you know, he's, he's saying that he's grounding us. You know, he's saying that we can't go to this place that before we, he said we'd get to go to. And now we don't get to go there. He, he's, he's grounding us and, he, you know, he's saying that we can't go to the paradise that he said that we could go to and, well, you, <laughs> we'll just see about that. We're going to go anyway. And so they're again disobeying because their punishment was handed down from high and they didn't want to carry it out. Those of you who were, uh, let's go with rebellious teenagers, was there ever a time when you were told not to go and do something or you were told not to go and spend time with someone by your parents? I think most children probably have that experience. Don't do this. Don't go see this person. Don't hang around with them. Don't go to this place. I was. And in retrospect, not just because they're here. Uh, <laughs> hindsight's twenty twenty. In retrospect, most of the time it wasn't due to disobedience on my part that I heard those things. It was because my parents were protecting me from a potentially bad situation or from a potentially bad relationship. Have you ever had that revelation some 10, 20, 30 years later? That, you know, maybe they weren't out just, just out to get me. Maybe it was for my own good that they told me that. Gosh. Sometimes when that roadblock is put in our path and we run into them, Sometimes when that roadblock is put in our path, it is because God is protecting us from something. And sure, it can be because of obedience, or disobedience rather. You know, that's why that roadblock was there. It was because of disobedience. And then that roadblock was there, and then they said, you know what, we're just going to go around it. And so while the roadblock is there because of disobedience, at the very same time, it can be a teaching moment. 
or it can be uh, our loving Father protecting us from the place that we're desiring to go. And so when we run into those roadblocks, it isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes we can learn from that. I think we're probably supposed to all the time. But we have to be conscious of that. I have a, a passage written on my whiteboard in my office and I, I have to remind myself every day. And so I just want to share this with you. It's Proverbs 19:21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. I got all kinds of things rattling around in here that seem to make sense to me. They may not make sense to anybody else. And it doesn't matter what those are because it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. His will is more important than my plans. And so these people, they want to go, they, they know they're in trouble. They know they're in trouble and they're like, we got plans. We are going to go over there and we are going to, we're going to do what we are supposed to do. But God had plans. God had plans, and it is his plans that are ultimately going to stand. And when we find ourselves in those situations, we have a decision to make. We can either accept that punishment, learn from those lessons. Punishment isn't even the right term. We can accept the, what's, what's the expression? Um, I've, I've made my bed, now I have to lay in it. Like you have to deal with the consequences of the decisions you've made. And so we can either choose to do that and thank God, as difficult as that may, to, may be to do, or we can disobey and like the Israelites, find ourselves in an even worse situation. And so when God says jump, you jump. We also learn in this passage that, you know, there is no amount of yakety yak that is going to get us out of it. There isn't. No amount of it. If you look closely at this passage, let me, I'll read this again. It's verses 39 and 40. So when Moses told these words to all the people of Israel, again, that's the judgment of God. The, you're you're going to have to wander. It says, The people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We will go up to the place that the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Now that's an interesting passage. If you look closely, they were not telling God, we don't care what you say. They were not telling God, we don't care what you say, we're going to go anyway. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is, God, we messed up. We sinned. And we feel bad for it. It says they mourned greatly. They wept bitterly. We feel bad. We know we messed up. We feel terrible. And so we are going to try and make up for it. Right? We realize that we've sinned and so now we're going to go to this place. We're going to do now what we were supposed to do then. Husbands, you're turning the spotlight. Have you ever done anything wrong? I realize that's Kind of a ridiculous questions. I mean, we never really do anything wrong, per se. We do some things that could maybe be misconstrued as being gray. <laughs> and what do you do? Have you ever done the dishes? Folded the laundry, cleaned the house, checked the things off the honey-do list? You know, to smooth over the fact that you did something you weren't supposed to do because maybe you stepped outside of the budget a little bit to get that thing that you thought you needed at the time? No. Have you ever done that? And so what's, her, what's your lovely wife's response when she sees the spotless house? As close to spotless as we can get it, ladies. What's her response when she sees the spotless house, the, uh, the, the tidied garage, the folded laundry? Your loving wife comes home and, you know, it's not, oh, thank you, honey. It looks fantastic. It's, what did you do? <laughs> what did you buy? Is there something you need to tell me? And I'm, I'm joking here, but you can see how that plays out. Because for some reason, we think that we can make up for our disobedience. 
don't we? Like, even though I messed up, I'm going to try and make it right. That's what the Israelites are doing. They're trying to make things right. They're trying uh, to do with their own power to get this. With their own power, they're trying to... What was their revelation when they went up to that hill country? It says, we have sinned. So what are they trying to do by their own power? They are trying to make up for their sins. Now, how much yakety yak do you suppose that's going to do? How, how much is that going to take? How much arguing with God, how much reasoning with God is it going to take a good and perfect God, a righteous and just God, an ever-present and eternal God to just say, you know, you talked me into it. How much talking is that going to take? I think we all know the answer, don't we? Maybe it's the, the words of the old hymn. You know what? We did the first line, second line. Why don't I get the first one here? Who can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We can't make up for it. We can't. It was not the work of their hands, the, the words of their mouths, or even the edge of their sword that could make things right for God. For them and for us, it's obedience. It's obedience. It's, it's saying, you know, uh, I've got camp on my mind and so it's, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's being obedient to God's will. It's doing, well, it's jumping when he says jump. It's realizing that his plans are more important than my plans. It's obedience. Look at Jesus, the one who washes away sins. It was his obedience that washes away our sins. It was his sacrifice that did that for us. I want to close with an illustration. I heard a story from a friend of mine earlier this week and, and he put this uh, interesting scenario in front of me and I thought about it and it, it, it seemed to fit really well here. So a father had several kids and had a big barn and it was becoming dilapidated. Um, it needed to be painted in order to preserve it moving into the future. And so dad said, you know, right as soon as school got out, he went up to his kids and he says, look kids, that barn, it needs to be painted. And, uh, and it would cost a lot for me to, to pay somebody to come and paint that. And so how about this? How about if, if the three of you, if you get together and over the course of the summer, if you scrape the old paint off, and if you put new paint on, and if you can have that done by Labor Day, then all of us, me and your mom and, and the three of you, then we're gonna go to we're gonna go to Disneyland for a week. And the kids are, well, yeah. And so they agree to it. And then summer comes and you know how, how it works, you know, a little bit of scraping here, you know, maybe half a gallon, wow, okay, let's be realistic, probably a quart to paint here. <coughs> You know, and so dad reminds them of what's going on here and, and yeah, they shrug it off and the kids play and they have fun and, and then Labor Day comes. And the kids don't really realize it. So the following day, the family's around dinner time and dad says to the kids, well, you know, it's, it's the day after Labor Day today. Um, you, uh, you realize that you didn't get the barn painted in time. Uh, we're not going to be able to go to Disneyland now. I, I'm going to have to pay somebody to come and to come and do this. And and so the kids, they naturally, I mean, you do what kids do, ball their heads off. <laughs> but then it's interesting because over the course of the next week, once you know it, that barn got scraped and that barn got painted. So what do you do? I mean, put yourself in, in that parent's situation, in their shoes. I mean, there was a contract, a verbal contract, a, a covenant, we'll call it, and said, look, if you do this, then we'll do this. If you fail to do that, then we're not going to. And so if it's after the fact, I mean, do you, do you give in? Do you extend grace in that situation? Do you say, well... 
even though you didn't get it done when I said it needed to be done, we're going to go anyway? That doesn't really send the right message either, though, does it? That's a tough situation. But our God is perfectly just. He said, these are the terms. You disobeyed. And so you're not going to get to enter. And they said, well, we, we know we didn't get it done like when you said we were supposed to get it done. So we're, we're ready now. We're going to do it now. And then they expect to reap the rewards of the covenant that they already broken. Remember, we are utterly and completely dependent on God. The Israelites tried to do it alone. It didn't work. They needed God's hand of protection. They needed God's strength, his perseverance. Remember that we serve a God who loves each and every one of us and that he wants the best for us and that to obey God means to live according to the purpose that you've been made for. And they're unique. I mean, there's, there's much more broad umbrella purposes to know God, to help others get to know God, to worship him in spirit and in truth, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We all have a purpose. Some of them are unique. There are some that cover all of us. But at the same time, just as the Israelites were to go and take the promised land, living up to our purpose is the abundant life. That's our promised land. That's life eternal. That's what Jesus came to offer us. And so don't let disobedience stand in the way of living that abundant life. So I don't know exactly what's going on in your life today. I don't know exactly what happened last week or the week before that. But you might, might. He absolutely does. And so as we move into prayer time and our, our closing song this morning, I'd like us to pray together and ask the Lord to show us those places where he's opened doors and we've failed to go through them. And then gone back and said, well, we try and kick it open ourselves and it doesn't work so well. You know, to maybe illuminate those places in our lives where we've disobeyed. Maybe over and over and over again without knowing it. Or, you know what, we do this too over and over and over again deliberately. Let's close with a word of prayer.